problems, guys. Full of yeah, not a problem. I'm so sorry for all the problems there. Getting caught up with the initial hiccup. <laughs> Okay, so in this study, we are focusing on hypercolic system. So, uh, the hypercolic propellants have been widely used in rockets and aircrafts. So, typically, the hypercolic propellants consist of a uh, fuel and an oxidizer. So traditionally, hydrogen and hydrogen derived fuels can be used as fuel, and the nitrogen dioxide can be used as oxidizers. So when these two components are contact, there will be spontaneous ignition, even at room temperature. So the hypocritic reactions have been studied in the literature, but it is from the barrier height, it's like 0.4 electron volts, so which is very high. So it is unclear why the hypocolic reaction happens at room temperature. So in this study, we want to figure it out. So another thing is, so traditionally, uh, classical pass approximation is used as basis for computational calculations. But if hydrogen motion is involved in chemical reactions, then CPA is not safe anymore, so we need to remove this approximation. So in this study, we first use uh, DFT-based ab initial molecular dynamics to simulate the chemical reaction of model mass of hydrogen with nitrogen dioxide. Uh, from AIMD calculations, we can get ab initial potential energy surface. With this potential energy surface, we can use it as an input to run additional nuclear repacket dynamics calculations. So the take home message is uh, quantum tunneling is responsible for the hypergolic reaction for this system. So here I'm going to skip the computational details. So this result shows the uh, uh, chemical reactions in the early stages of AMD trajectories. So here, these three panels corresponding to three sequential steps of hydrogen transfer. So this is the first hydrogen transfer reaction, like I show here. And uh, after three sequential steps of hydrogen transfer, we end up with uh, this kind of uh, compound. So from this energy diagram, we can identify the barrier height. For example, for the first hydrogen transfer reaction, the barrier height is about uh, 0.5 electron volts. So the barrier height is just the uh, energy difference between the reactant and the least, least stable uh, intermediate. So, so this table here is the results for beta charge analysis. So the point is uh, to show the hydrogen being transferred is actually proton instead of radicals. And uh, these two panels shows uh, the number of different species uh, in the AMD trajectories. So, so basically, in, in addition to the three sequential steps of hydrogen transfer, we also observe other chemical reactions. For example, we observe the breaking of a carbon and a nitrogen bond. So here, I use some simplification and also some mathematical operations. We can just convert the energy diagram to this one-dimensional uh, potential energy surface. So in this diagram, the vertical axis is energy, the horizontal axis is a reaction path. So this diagram can be used as input for nuclear wave packet dynamics. So our initial molecular dynamics is wrong at a very high temperature, like 2,000 Kelvin, but our 
uh, nuclear repacker dynamics can be drawn at various temperatures, even at low temperatures. So here I show an example. This is the repack dynamics at room temperature. So here's the red. This is the initial state. And the green, this is the final state. So initially, the center of the Gaussian wave packet is at uh, minus one uh, atomic unit of uh, position. And as, to, as time goes by, uh, the nuclear wave packet uh, move towards a positive direction. So finally, we can see uh, some wave packet passes through the barrier. Uh, the majority is just reflected back. Okay, so here is uh, another picture showing this process. So this is uh, our initial, and as time goes by, at around four, around two hundred forty atomic unit of time, we can see the splitting of the packet. So from this. Diagram we can see about uh, five percent of the packet has passed through the barrier, and about eighty percent has reflected back. So here, this diagram shows the uh, uh, fitting for the reaction rates. So, uh, like I said before, the nuclear wave packet can be performed at different temperatures. So here. Uh, each point corresponding to a specific temperature and uh, from each one we can get the reaction rate by using this reaction rate we can fit into Reynolds equation so from uh, Reynolds equation we can get the parameters like uh, A prime, B and C with this we can get the Reynolds uh, activation energy so the Reynolds activation energy is uh, temperature dependent but at room temperature, it is about 0.03 electron volts. So the activation energy from Arena's equation is much lower than the uh, barrier height in ab initial molecular uh, dynamics calculations. So my result is uh, first AMD calculations can be used to capture the chemical reaction of this hypergolic system and also through the wave packet, uh, we can say uh, the hydrogen channeling is responsible for this reaction. That's it. Okay, well, thank you. Any questions, conceptual or about organization? log over k the yep. top right one yeah that one so k in this case is the rate of reaction right yes so you so the rate of reaction goes down as the temperature goes up or am i, am I reading that the other way around daniel can you read what is uh, x uh, x is for, for this figure uh one thousand divided by by Kelvin? Divide by Kelvin. Yeah. So, uh, in which direction temperature growth? Uh, so this part is the room temperature. Okay. So this is high temperature. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. More questions? If no, then thank you once, once again. Okay. Um, Aaron, would you be interested to tell a story about your proposal? Uh, I can say something. Would be great. So, if you are working on the similar uh, projects, do not hesitate to uh, borrow some uh, ideas. So we interact with each other with two purposes. One, that each, and each of us in the audience serve as a 
reviewer to help the author. And in, on, on the other aspect, we all are learning from the author to improve our own research. There's zoom option on this. Huh? Zoom. Zoom. Control plus. Or maybe uh, rolling the mouse. Control and scroll the mouse. Mouse scroll. Control plus. Control plus minus. So, lead halide proskites have been pretty popular material over the last decade or so. And different uh, morphologies have become popular in different subfields. So, oh, I'm looking at a lead halide perovskite nanocrystal. And specifically, we're looking at uh, transition metal dope lead halide perovskites because, well, I mean, so perovskite column dots are cool, like on their own, like they're very good light emitters, but over time they can become unstable. And one way to try and increase the stability is to put things inside of them that will emit light. So eventually you can use like transition metals to be off uh, to be the emitters in different materials. And recently, a couple of years ago, people have been exploring uh, MN2 or manganese 2 plus dopants into these perhaps guys because light takes up a 2 plus oxidation state. So they're pretty similar in that respect so they should substitute and experimentally it's been observed that they resemble something resembling a, a spin flip transition from a from a triplet to triplet right word three halves can't remember the word three halves three half spin uh, so quartet quartet yeah, yeah. so it's been flipped from two, a three two halves, halves a, a yeah. triplet and then the next one, two halves from the quarter. Basically, transition from a three half to a five half. Transition. So, what we try to do in this work is to model the electronic structure and the excited state dynamics for these systems and to look at the possibility of spin flip transitions in these. We have to use more sophisticated. Uh, methodology than what's typically used. So we use a uh, spinner cone sham orbitals because with spin orbit coupling that facilitates the spin flip for transi transition metals. So if you don't have spin orbit coupling, you can't model spin flip transition. So we include that into our methodology. And I didn't highlight it earlier, but this is our model up in the top. So that's our perovskite quantum dot and then in the very center it is doped with a transition metal and it has a bromine halide field around it. And these are just uh, some equations we use to compute the observables in these systems. So for ground state electronic structure, I already mentioned we use spin orbit coupling and those give us cone jam spinner orbitals. So superposition of spin up and spin down. And we take those and we, we use these as a basis for ground state observables. So the two most prominent ones to look at is density of states and uh, absorption spectra. And we compute those using uh, transition dipoles. And then we also use spinners for excited state dynamics. So we use spinners as inputs for our non adiabatic couplings along a molecular dynamic trajectory. And then we process those into state to state rates. And Generally, we can uh, model the electron phonon interactions in these systems. So, for results, for a reference, we first looked at spin polarized calculations for this model. And we found it takes a high spin configuration, so five uh, unpaired electrons. And these two bumps here in the middle of the uh, conduction of valence band are uh, hybridized manganese states with the halides around them, which is shown in the PDOS below. So 
this answer here shows that it's roughly 50-50 percentage of manganese D orbitals bonding with halide P orbitals, or the bromine P orbitals surrounding it. And we do see that in the conduction band there is uh, some valent D states that are hanging around the, just around the conduction band edge, which is a good sign because if you're trying to get uh, photoluminescence from the materials, you want those D states to be near the band edge so that after non radiative relaxation, the electron occupies there. But when we go and do our spinner computed ground state electronic structure, we still see that we have these two. Uh, D states in the middle of the gap. And then when we look at our PDOS, we see that the MN2 plus states that are originally at the conduction band edge, they get, uh, uh, they get pushed deeper into the valence band due to a spin orbit, strong spin orbit coupling of the perovskite P orbitals to reduce the band gap. So, so basically we have the wrong energetic alignment for uh, spin flip transitions. If it is the case that it is uh, D to D transitions that are observed, observed experimentally. So, so using a GGA functional with spin orbit coupling, we can qualitatively get the right uh, uh, valence band electronic structure, but for the conduction band, it's not as well. Uh, it doesn't work as well. And below that is just some pretty orbital plots to go along with the spin polarized density of states. So you can see, so for the states that are within the gap, you can see that those are D orbitals. This is some sort of D X Y hybridized with P orbitals around it. And this is the D Z orbital, D Z squared that hybridized a little bit with the surrounding ligand field. Did you label it? Or are you just giving labels from the top of your, uh, from your, like knowledge and memory? Uh, that's mostly memory. Okay. It, 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 could, it could be reasonable to, to label. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, once you go into the conduction and valence band edge, it's more perovskite quantum dot states, or it's delocalized over the entire nanoparticle. So. Why is it have different background color? What does it mean? Uh, is it intentional or is it just, uh, it's technically difficult to keep the same color? Yeah, it's technically difficult. It's just from the software, because it's a slice. So okay. you, as you take your part chart or orbitals and it just slices through them. So the background just changes depending on the other orbitals that are around it. So the important thing is just the contrast. So, so we trudge along even with the qualitatively incorrect uh, valence band. We can still go through and try to compute uh, the DED transitions. And these, so here in this big plot is an absorption spectra comparing the spinner orbitals, which is the solid red line, and then the spin polarized are the dashed uh, orange and green. And so the big thing the takeaway here is if we zoom in on these low energy transitions, which are about an order magnitude less than uh, like absorption from the prospect quantum dot, we see the lowest two bands, those are um, MN3D to let 6P transitions. And that's just confirmed from looking at partial density states. And then once we get up to around 2.2 EV, we do see that we can see uh, DD optical transitions computed from the transition dipoles in the spinners. And then, yeah, then this diagram is just corresponding to the absorption spectra with each labels corresponding to the ones in the table. So for E and F, that's from Proskite band edge to MND state. And then this D is from MND to MN state. Is it good or bad, and how does it compare with experiment? Um, the energy 
the transition for the lowest transitions to pair fair favorably well to experiment. So what they see in experiment is around 600 nanometer, so that's about 2 EV. So it's, I mean, when I was first doing this, like it looked like a duck, so I had the right bank gap, the right transition energy, which you'd expect, but it's either, well, I guess it's unknown because in experiment they just infer that the PL they see is from the manganese dopants because it's traditionally if you have the so-called T4 to A1 transition with the manganese dopant in there. It's like you just assume it's that transition. A question. So if for an intrinsic crops guy with, some, with no dopants, so does the basic electronic structure look reasonable by using PB plus SOC? Yeah, so you get, so with perovskites, you get qualitatively correct band gap. Well, I take that back. If you don't use spin orbit coupling, you get qualitatively correct band gaps for like the size of the material you're looking at. So this one just happens to look experimentally correct, just due to the spin orbit coupling. So having the correct band gap is kind of just an accident. A nice accident, but. So then, yeah, that was its retrospector. So now I'm going to move on to modeling excited state dynamics in these systems. So like I said earlier, the conduction band isn't very reasonable to compare. Like, or what's the word I'm looking for? If we assume that the electronic structure is not correct, it's like we can't really gain any meaningful information from the dynamics of there. So mostly, I'm going to focus on the dynamics of the whole transitions because it seems like we can model those qualitatively, are pretty correct. So. What I did is I just compared the spin alpha or the spin up electrons, which contain the space within the gap, to the spinner non rate of relaxation. And so the red field tensors basically just control the rate of relaxation from one state to another. And once you put in an, an initial condition, these just tell the state how to relax to the band gap. So for both of the systems, I chose initial conditions which were roughly equal in energy. So for the whole transition, it's about one EV separation between the homo minus whatever I chose to the homo. And you can see that there's quite a wide variation in, in the relaxation time between those two. So this is on a log plot, so we can see for the spin alpha component, it relaxes to the band gap like, under sub picosecond, whereas for the spin orbit computed relaxation, it's above 10 picoseconds, edging up towards 100. So it's almost like a two to three orders of magnitude difference in the whole relaxation just based on computing with a different basis. So, and then these plots just kind of show how the population relaxes in time. So you can see it's a very quick relaxation from pretty much each state all the way to the homo. Whereas here there's a, like a bottleneck that happens from around homo minus two, homo minus one, and then up to homo. So I didn't exactly figure out what, like, what's like the physical reasoning behind this, because With spinners, you can't really compute orbitals for them, so you can't compare orbitals from the spin alpha with orbitals from the spinner. But I would suspect that the spin orbit coupling that tends to re like, to shrink your orbitals due to faster motion, like it contracts your orbitals. So if your orbitals are more contracted, there's going to be less spatial overlap with being non-orthogonal. 
Okay. So that's the best idea I have at the moment, but besides that, I haven't been able to think of a good reason for two to three orders of magnitude difference. Because the energy offsets between all the transitions are basically the same. So it's not an energetics thing, so it has to be due with the overlap of the orbitals along the trajectory. So that's still kind of a mystery. Is it possible that there is some difference in the charge density distribution in the intermediate states? Um, I don't know about the intermediate states, because you see, because if you look at the, like this waterfall plot, you see in the intermediate states, it's, it's like they even, appears like the rates of transition are even quicker, like further away from the gap. Huh. So the long dynamics that you are blaming happens only between two lowest states, right? like Luma and Luma plus one. It's the D to D transitions, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the D orbitals are going to have, they have a spin orbit influence. So if you include spin orbit coupling into the basis, that might make them more orthogonal to each other, or it's a better basis to describe transition metals. It's a really hand wavy argument, but it's the only one I got. But if, if, we, if one would uh, explore spatial distribution, then for the last two states, this uh, home and home, what are, what is they? Home or minus one. And home minus one and home. The charge density will, in both states, it stays in the same region on the doping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. From the PDOS analysis, they're still both the, the orbitals I was showing earlier. So it's still these two. States and it's roughly the same hybridization. Mm -hmm. So it seems like when you so this is with a spin polarized basis. If, when you include spin orbit coupling, they become more orthogonal to each other. Because that's one problem with the GGA functionals. It's your orbitals tend to over deolocalize. So spin orbit coupling, and you can think about it in some ways, including like exchange correlation effects too, to correct the orbitals. Did you take a close look at the PDOS? So what is the degree of hybridization for these two actors? About 40% metal ion. Or, met, or manganese orbitals, about 40% bromine P, and then the other 10% is either ligand or S orbital, or PBS. And I guess it's a higher, well, just looking at the image, you can tell that's for the topmost state. This one, it's more like, I guess still 40% of the bromides around it, but it's less of the D metal. So, yeah, still kind of a puzzle right now. And it is the main conclusion. For, yes. <laughs> we are still puzzled. <laughs> okay, it's good for science to stay puzzled. Keeps me in a job. So, then speaking of exchange, correlation, and different functionals, excuse me, so, some work within the last couple of months is seeing if there are different methodologies to get the correct band alignment, assuming that you have that you need both your D transition metals to be within the gap for conduction and valence band. So one study we did was using DFT plus U with spin orbit coupling and just systematically scanning U parameters. And short 
story is if you include like the bigger you choose your U, the worse the result is, or the higher pushes the D metals into the conduction band. So that was did not work. And so we've also tried a couple of different hybrid functionals. So the first class of like quantum dots to be doped were like the CAD selenide, zinc, sulfide types. So that, those have been the most explored mo ones for modeling. And it seems like PB0 was the best functional to model the d orbitals in those systems. But for when we tried that for our system, we got worse results than with the GGA. The valence band d orbitals were pushed inside the gap, or pushed into the band more, and same for the conduction band. While with the SHE06, which isn't fully done yet, but it only needs a couple more steps to converge, you can see that, well, I didn't multiply the doping states, but there is some a hybridized doping state within the gap. And, it's hard to see, but the valence in the valence band, the dopant states are hybridized with like LUMO plus three, LUMO plus four. So it's not too far from the band edge. So it seems like looking at functionals which include more of HSE character, describe these systems better. I'm not sure exactly why, because I'm not sure of the technical differences between all of them. I know they ex include different um, amounts of the hartree Fock exchange and some other different parameters. But I'm not exactly sure why one functional, or the, why the HSE works better than PBO. So, conclusions for all this work is we are, we're able to successfully compute spin flip transitions in these systems from optical, from looking at the optical spectra. We can see the D to D transition for non-radiative hole relaxation, it was slowed down by two orders of magnitude using uh, spin orbit coupling compared to uh, spin polarized calculation, which we attribute to spin orbit coupling be a, being a better basis to describe uh, transit transition metals. And more work is needed for screen functionals that can accurately model both conduction and valence band for doped quantum dot or doped perovskite systems. So that is it. Okay, let's thank Aaron. Any questions or suggestions? Please? I have a technical question. So for your DFT plus your calculations, so you only modify the U term, right? Did you play with the I guess J term? J. Yeah. Um well, I didn't do the calculation myself, the collaborator did. I would have to dig around in the directories that he did, but it doesn't seem like it because the, the way you labeled the folders, it was U0 is U1, U2, U3. So I, he must have kept J constant, unless you just change it with each one, but I doubt it. Because it seems you need to find the combination of the U yes, and two. Yes, you're correct. Okay. More questions? Um, what made you choose those specific full relaxation? Like mm -hmm. the, your homo minus 15, your lumo plus five? I was, I was trying to see why, why you chose those specifically. Um, I chose them based on to compare, to get a, like an accurate comparison between the relaxation. So I chose so that both of these, like if this is delta E, that Delta E for both of these was about the same. Okay. Because, like, if, if you assume it follows like a rate law, it's like your initial condition will affect that. So you want them to be both the same. More questions? One. More questions? Two. More questions? Three. Let's thank everyone once again. I had a question why you didn't show uh, photoluminescence, but maybe you didn't send it down. Yes. It would fit. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if it is only the reason try to fit, because it can fit because we are allowed for four feet. Sure. Well, that I didn't want to display the 
0.05% yeah, it is yeah because you you create really great impression by your uh, oral presentation is high peer contribute and then on poster you can discourage people <laughs> of this nice poster to the stage and uh, if you if you were making comments for Aaron or Daniel please uh, share share your comments with me such as one dimensionality and um, high surface to volume ratio uh, so especially class of uh, nano materials and uh, they are in solar cells lasers so the electronic property of properties of silicon nanowires have been studied theoretically already but it does not include uh, multiple key points and we know that uh, um, periodic solids needs uh, Mm, multiple uh, key points. So in our previous study, how uh, we studied electron dynamics on um, different silicon nanowires, but we did not uh, include um, uh, a multiple uh, key points. Mm -hmm. So now in this research, we uh, we studied. Uh, in result of uh, dynamics of two different silicon nanowires, uh, silicon 001 or 100 and uh, silicon 111. Uh, here you can see this. Here you can see the dispersion curve of uh, uh, two different nanowires. Um, actually, um, I uh, calculated dispersion curve for si 16 different key points uh, and uh, uh, four different key points. So, and then um, I, it has it, it is appeared that uh, I didn't include, include 16 uh, key points uh, dispersion curve here, but uh, um, yeah, if we compare both of them, we can see uh, the states uh, shapes of the states are. Are pretty same, so we decided to go stick with uh, uh, four different key points, and uh, for each uh, key point, we need to deal with uh, around 1,000 uh, um, coupling files. Uh, so four key points is good. Uh, other, if we include more than four key points, it would be computationally expensive. So here uh, we see we can see the models like a top of uh, top view of uh, two uh, nanowires models. And uh, here we can see the transition. This is direct transition and this is indirect transition, but it is uh, for optical transition uh, to excite the electron from balance band to the uh, conduction band. Here we can see the kind of zoom in. Uh, uh, image of this portion, conduction band of silicon uh, uh, 100 nanowire. And here we can see there are two kinds of uh, transitions. Uh, one is at the same key point and another one is one key point to another key point. So same key point transitions are direct transitions and um, uh, transitions between two different key points are indirect transitions. And these are non-adiabatic uh, transitions. So there are two transitions optical here and non uh, over there. Uh, now I'm going 
going to talk about the methodology, uh, what method was used uh, to study this uh, uh, research. Uh, so uh, we considered uh, molecular dynamics trajectory uh, for calculating the on the fly electron to a lattice coupling. Here the main equation is a uh, one electron function equation and this is the uh, solution of this equation. And we can see this uh, wave function is dependent on um, k point. So, and so if we excite electrons from balance band to conduction band, and when electrons come back to the um, band edge, it couples with the nuclear motion, uh, and um, it includes different um, time steps here. So here we can see the time dependency, but this is not a and then uh, this is the coupling uh, equation. Here this wave function is at k point and this is at a different k point, k prime, um, at a different time steps. So, uh, he, and uh, since momentum is not conserved, so k prime is not equal to uh, k. Um, and uh, once we have the uh, coupling, Couplings, we can calculate the autocorrelation function is from the coupling equation, and and uh, if we have uh, autocorrelation function, so we can get direct uh, rates of transitions from the Fourier transform of autocorrelation function. And then uh, those rates of transitions are the component of red field tensors. Uh, and the time evolution of density matrix equation is here and this, this. The second term on the right hand side is the electronic energy dissipation. Uh, is for electron, electronic energy dissipation. So here, this equation is for non-equilibrium charge distribution. Uh, and here, this one is the is for equilibrium charge distribution. And then we can see the expectation value. Expectation value of energy is a function of energy time. <laughs> good, 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 good. Keep going. And, and then we can. The rate of relaxation we can get uh, using this equation um, and by fitting this equation. And uh, we, this is just uh, we solved for rate of relaxation from this equation. Now I'm going to talk about. Uh, how to select initial states for dynamics calculation. Uh, in order to do that, we used MATLAB code. And uh, since we know we need uh, red field tensors for calculating dynamics, so we, we used the um, same MATLAB code for calculating our uh, red field tensors. And I have a question. So what's the meaning of a MATLAB code to a stranger? What is that? So if I there is people from outside, what's the meaning of MATLAB code? Uh, then I would say that we, we just use the methods. <laughs> but, um, Do I need to include that? I don't know. No, no, no. Which equation or set of equations is solved numerically in MATLAB code? You can point oh. like, here are the equations, mm -hmm. and we are not solving them uh, analytically as in differential equation uh, forms, mm -hmm. but we just use numerical propagation or whatever. Okay. But point out which. So it's a red field tensor equation? Just point which equation. Uh. Okay. Uh, Once again, which one? This red field tensor. 
but it is uh, the code for correlation, right? Mm -hmm. And the dynamics is solved in which code, uh, which for dynamic uh, when you run for dynamics, mm -hmm. which equations are being solved? No, no, it, it's observable. Higher, higher up, higher up, higher up. Oh, this equation. This two. Mm -hmm. This and the next one. Okay. No, no. This is one. This and then where? You see, uh, time derivative of density. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Time and derivative yes, of and the next next uh, line. This you, one. Yes. So it is basically one equation split on two on two lines. Yeah. And it is main equation that is solved numerically in, in the code. Okay. Since uh, we uh, we have four different key points, so we have four different energy pop files. And Can I ask a question? What's the meaning of energy pop? Uh, it contains the states and the energies, and um, it contains the uh, number of states. Like we are interested, suppose if we are interested in 30 states below homo and 30 states below homo, so it contains those active uh, states. So for four different key points, we have four different energy of parts and how uh, we combine all of them together. Yeah, and the name of the resultant energy profile is this one. And uh, this is the format, like it is a uh, part of, one part of an resultant energy profile. Here we can see how the um, energy states are arranged in the resultant uh, energy profile. So this is, for LOMO for K.1 um, and then for K point, LOMO for K.2 and then 3 and then K.4 then LOMO plus 1 for K.1 and it uh, goes uh, this uh, sequentially and um, for dynamics calculation we would consider this LOMO is this one is initial state 1 for K.1 um, this one is uh, uh, electron state two for uh, k point one. What is the energy? Oh, please go ahead. What is the energy here? Energy column. Energy this. Yeah. What energy it is? It is so like energy of energy that state. Energy of that state. Can, can you show it on your diagram because you have? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mama, uh, So energy of these states, like if, um, if it is oh, okay. Okay. So this is a so uh, what uh, both Yulun and uh, Jabot were trying to say, what you are telling is absolutely right, but you are using colloquial language that we developed inside the group. People outside will not understand. Energy pop, they will not understand. No, no, no way. Okay. <laughs> so you need, you need to use stand, and even the, the word states is not very appropriate. You, you should use, tell like band or orbital. Band is better word. So each band in the band structure is uh, distributed by several discrete points, and uh, we inspect it, uh, we inspect its energy, and then uh, look how the occupation goes between this. Okay, I was thinking not standard name. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Here, uh, on top of this um, side, uh, so I split, uh, I put two columns here one for silicon 100 and another for silicon 111 and I put um, the relaxation rates for um, five different states at gamma point only and since um, the whole table will not cannot fit here so I just um, 
place to gamma points states and only five states. But I did calculate for uh, 10 states for each key point. And I know I need to edit this uh, thing like uh, title of each column. And so I can uh, calculate it uh, electron dynamics um, for LOMO plus 12. And in resultant, in resultant uh, a band file, uh, this uh, LOMO plus 12 state is initial state 50, and it is for uh, uh, initial state 50, but it is for um, uh, gamma point LOMO plus 12. And for silicon one one one, um, I did it the same way, but this time I considered uh, initial state forty. That is no plus nine uh, state uh, at gamma point. So bend one plus nine at yeah. at, at uh, spe with specific value of momentum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and then I uh, calculated. Um, for each nanowire, for each key point, relaxation rate for 10 different states. And then I calculated uh, the relaxation time from the relaxation rate. And uh, then I took the natural logarithm of uh, that relaxation time and uh, made graphs. Then this x-axis represents the dissipated energy, the energy difference between the uh, band state and their corresponding uh, excited state. And the same thing for silicon 111 also. Um, so in order to fit the, um, these uh, rates, uh, by the way, this, uh, these rates for, how you can see the empty, uh, empty points, those for indirect transitions, like uh, if electron transfer from one k-point to the same k-point, then we call it an indirect transition, and those empty, empty points for indirect transition. And these field points for, uh, we would say all transitions, includes indirect, direct, uh, everything, uh, I mean overall transitions. And if we fit this uh, 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 relaxation rates, we see that um, for a couple of initial steps, uh, it uh, follows a gap law, and after that, uh, it follows a inverse gap law, and uh, almost for all key points. On the other hand, the same thing. So I should put a uh, gap law and inverse gap law there. So, and then what we did, uh, we calculated the transition difference between direct and um, all transitions. So we saw the transition difference. It is a pretty constant for three different k points, and uh, for one k point, uh, uh, for zero point five, the change is linear. For silicon one zero zero nanowire. For silicon 111 nanowire, we see that uh, for 0 0.16 uh, and 0 0.13, for these two k points, uh, uh, relaxation rate, uh, uh, the difference between re relaxation rates are um, constant, but for the other two k points, um, the change is uh, the difference is linear. Here, I put uh, um, how electron. Uh, there is a movie, but I took the snapshot uh, for first initial, and this is intermediate from the final. It, this one should be here in the final state. So how uh, energy changes with momentum? Uh, <clears throat> we can see from these two figures. So this is the trajectory of the electron is coming to the bandage. And this is the same thing, so <clears throat> oh, 
So we I need to compute the states of, from where it started. Okay, I, I remember this one is from 23 long. Plus three for k point. I don't remember exactly, but I put the initial states number here. And so this is the same thing, like how energy it changes with momentum um, here. Uh, this is the same thing like I took the snapshots from initial and the, and the final um, steps. And then uh, I need to put more, two, at least two more figures, how momentum changes with time here. Yeah. Why? What are you going to prove with these figures? Yes. That, that momentum changes with time. Okay, here is a summary of the outcome of this research. So, <clears throat> the conclusion is uh, indirect transition is quicker than direct transition uh, since. Um, Sorry, not, not indirect, I should correct that one. So all transition is always quicker than direct one uh, because in all transition there are more pathways to relaxing, uh, that's why. And uh, so we, we see the, we saw that uh, for uh, first couple of uh, uh, states, a relaxation rate is following gap law, and after that, at higher energies, it follows the inverse gap law. Yeah. And I, I would like to have this jogging. That's all. That's it? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. More questions? I have a very stupid question about the green background color. I guess maybe it doesn't make sense. So oh, why you I have this, the green background color figure? This one? Yeah. So, so why you have this the specific? Plot, when, um, the, in MATLAB code, the plot, it was selected certain category. It might be different color, it is different. I don't care about color, but why you have this specific trajectory? Oh. Can we do? Is it possible? Well, you we mean can the do trajectory means this path. Yes. Can we do like directly transition first, and then we do indirect transition? Uh, yeah, we can. Oh. Yeah, we can do indirect transition that the whole point mm -hmm. is to enable simultaneous change of both energy and momentum. Uh, as soon as we depart from uh, quantum dots and molecules as we go into solids, this uh, the change of momentum becomes reality. It is a natural effect that can be uh, can take leading role and. Uh, we do not know, we cannot assume before we start calculation what happens first, to relax a little energy and then change momentum, or first change momentum and then relax, we make them simultaneous. So, yes, that's my point. So, basically we have a starting point and we had an end point, right? So, what we are doing right now is to find the best road. Um, I understand your question. You are telling, uh, thinking like in uh, uh, theoretical mechanics with uh, Lagrangian, this uh, least action path. Right. No. Uh, here, Fatima sets up only initial condition, initial point. And uh, before the dynamics has been run, one doesn't know where you end up. So one not only optimizes trajectory, one also optimizes the end point. Uh, one can intuitively predict where it will be. So it should end up at the minimum of the dispersion curve. 
but uh, who knows, maybe sometime it will end up in, in different point. And if you look, Fatima, can you finger on the right most uh, green figure? Uh, not left, right. Next. Yes. See, the, there are three orange points. Mm -hmm. So is, uh, the end point of trajectory is equ uh, equally distributed between several values of uh, momentum. More questions for Fatima? Can you make waterfall these or make waterfall plots? There is a possible place. Oh, green things? Yeah. No, but these trajectories. Mm, maybe. No, because it seems strange to me that even with like that, because the trajectory that the left one follows, it like it ends up at a point where the energy spacing is larger. So it seems odd to me that overall that route is significantly shorter than one that's momentum restricted. That makes sense. So I'm just wondering like if it's if there's like a build up of population at that point as it's trying to relax or if it's just <coughs> happens to be a quick route even with the so what, what you're suggesting is to, instead of making snapshots of the distribution, to uh, make a waterfall to show the dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. But, but uh, it is not possible, at least I, I don't see how, how it is possible, because in all our previous, um, can you focus on higher part, upper part of the, of the poster? Yes, I don't know if you, if I will have time to approach your poster and help during formal presentation. But so here you can do one-dimensional curve at each point of time and make waterfall figure. So Aaron is uh, um, asking: Is it possible to show dynamics all intermediate states on uh, on uh, in the poster? So here we have several intermediate states, the whole profile of dynamics. But if we are coming here, it is this is one dimensional distribution with time as a parameter. One dimensional with one parameter. Here it is two dimensional distribution with time as a parameter. So at each point of time, this is this uh, it, this is not point. It is kind of Gaussian distribution with shape, and it moves its average position and it changes its shape uh, with time. So um, it would be not waterfall, but one can represent it uh, same as people as uh, medical tomography. Slice of two-dimensional distribution at each point of time. So it is slices. Yeah, that makes sense. Just some way to characterize the populations mm -hmm. of states at each. And uh, visualization of uh, calculations that Fatima is doing is a really big challenge because before everything what each of us were doing. It was taking like several energy, s several um, orbitals at different energies, and full occupation of each orbital as function of time. And here is additional dimension. For each band, for each orbital, uh, there are replicas with different values of momentum, and they are additional. We, we do not know which word to use, states. So if here there were like 20 orbitals, and she is using like four k points. It is eighty states instead of twenty, and one needs to follow population of each of them. So it is uh, really breaking minds and hearts. <laughs> Are you satisfied? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. More questions? Maybe e one comment. Instead of Please. Referring to uh, as all transitions and direct transitions, maybe something along the lines of like momentum restricted, momentum unrestricted. Good. Uh, I think that would come. Uh, it's yes. more intuitive, mm -hmm. at least for me anyway. Mm -hmm. did, did you write it? I was, yeah, I was in the process. Okay. Uh, please join me in thanking Fatima once again. Please. Uh, feedback and we
We should have two more in the remaining. Uh, oh. Can you please resend it to dmitry.qn at gmail.com? Uh, Javid, can you quickly over your poster while London is sending email? Uh, just uh, entertain us with example of good sense. And there, there is only one copy of Javits form, so uh, one can pass it uh, around and make it. You want it on your end, yes. You mean that? No, do you mean that? So you, you, you please start and tell. Uh, that's the one that I sent you for. So this is my second poster I'm going to present on the SES, but my apologies actually, I'm not complete. I didn't make anything yet. So this is my oh, okay. old poster. So I'm going to take a lot of stuff from the old posters. So yeah. since I supposed to present today, I just sent him the old one. So this is on my work on the silver cluster. And this silver cluster, we are interested in silver cluster because small silver cluster has a very you know, diverse and um, photophysical properties, which can be applicable in the even in biological sensor or especially in more biological sensor type applications. So problem is in this case, uh, main, uh, main uh, purpose of using of silver cluster is when the silver cluster becomes smaller like 10 or 20 uh, atom size, less than 20 atom sizes. So its uh, photophysical property is completely dependent on the conform conformation of the cluster as well as the interaction with the nucleotide molecule. See, uh, since it will change the photophysical uh, absorptions or emission based on the interaction of nucleotides, so this type of uh, cluster can be used in biosensor because in in specific interaction with a specific DNA or RNA, it will emit the specific uh, wavelength of light, or it will show the specific uh, uh, absorption spectra. It's known as a structure absorption phenomenon. So that's why we are trying to, we are working on a smaller size, like less than 10. But in this paper, I'm going to show mainly the monomer and dimer of the five and six silver cluster. Five and six means six silver atoms and five silver atoms. So it's very, very small size. And although it's a small size, but its conformation can be changed due to the, as I say, interaction with the DNA RNA. We know that DNA has a backbone chain, so it's not that um, flexible. But so due to the interaction with the nucleotide, uh, specific nucleotides, based on the 3D conformation of the DNA, it will give you the different conformation of silver cluster. And from the experimental group, and this is also a collaboration from the experimental group, our experiment, they have a lot of uh, extensive work but one of the their finding is they found that and uh, when they form the monomer and now with the time by changing the pH and something uh, experimental uh, setup this monomer can form a dimer shape but they are not sure about the conformation of the monomer or either dimer either one and and thing is well, if you look on the absorption spectrum, this is the experimental uh, absorption spectrum. A red line is showing the absorption spectrum of the dimer, and black line is a monomer. They saw that whatever the size of this uh, cluster, when they form the dimer, the lowest energy peak is going to uh, diminish. It's, it's become a dark uh, peak, and the second absorption peak is increases the intensity specifically. And the third one is going to uh, going to the going to lower intensity than monomer in that case. So we started with these experimental results. We tried to figure out the conformations or mechanism of the dimer formations. Since we don't have any spectral uh, spectroscopic result, we started in the very beginning or very 
we have a lot of different uh, degree of freedom to get, make uh, confirmations. Yeah, we make a confirmation on that one. So in primary case, we started with the lowest bare silver cluster confirmations, and then we ligated with the say cytosine mainly, and mixed in other in another study we started with the cytosine mixed with the guanine. The reason of the using cytosine mainly because uh, most of the experimental results they show that they they have shown that they have found the emission emissive cluster when they use the cytosine uh, rich nucleotides. And, and there are some other studies they also found that this intensity, I mean absorption intensity or emission intensity could be increased by introducing the guanine. But only guanine rich uh, nucleotides is not emissive, but it's increased the intensity when it started with the cytosine. But they have no explanation of why cytosine is uh, emissive or how guanine is increasing. This is just empirical result is intensity, but they don't have a, any concrete explanation of that. So we don't we don't trying to explain that one, but we use that one. we that's why we used guanine and cytosine in our system. So we may we take a, a linear gym uh, sorry planar geometry of five and six and then precipitated with the cytosine and guanine and optimized. We found out the optimized uh, silver 5 and silver 6 monomolecule. So in, if I look at the first study, I mean first part of our study, this I'm showing the um, 3D confirmation of the, of the cluster based on their charge and their ligands, how they're changing. So this one is example for the optimized uh, silver six cluster. So if you look at here, this as I said, confirmation is very important in this case. That's why I'm showing the confirmation hours, the final confirmation of the cluster. This, uh, this one is optimized with the all cytosine, only cytosine. So if you look, we started with the planar geometry, and after the optimization in the in, in the solvent medium, it's keep almost planar geometry. If you look at the, this one is a little bit tilted, but it's, it's, it's keeping a more symmetric structure. And this one is a little bit uh, distorted from the planar because of uh, this, uh, repulsion between the cytosine cluster. And this one is a charge one. And if you look at charge one, charge one is completely changed the, uh, changed the 3D con planar conformations is become a 3D one, and but if you look at the silver five, this one is a guanine one, cytosine one. This one is still retain the uh, planar one, and also, but in this case, one I like guanine one and six is completely distorted from the 3D. Is because of guanine guanine nucleotide, guanine nucleotide is larger in sizes, so it's they have a steric repulsion view with the cytosines, and is distorted to the uh, 3D on the 2D confirmations. And the effect of this one, if you look on the absorption spectra, uh, this one, there were four panels, and this panel, this one is, this two panel for silver five, these two panel for silver six, and the top one is neutral, and in both cases, this one is a charge one, one plus charge. And in, in this case, this uh, black one with the cytosine, five cytosine, green one, uh, sorry, red one with the two guanine, three cytosine, and blue one with the five guanines. It's, it's, and they have all with the same uh, pattern. And the first one, if you look at here, in the, in this, in the neutral one, is showing that when you add uh, two guanine, it increases the distance, it increases this peak, and is decreasing the intensity of this peak. But in case of five guanine and five cytosines, this peak intensity is almost same. So, but in this, this low energy peak, there have a couple of peaks here, two, three peaks in this, uh, this one is the main peak. This peak are because of uh, doublet conformations, and this is the, usually is dark, it's not emissive, 
in this case doublet transition and they have it's also combinations uh, it's also a mixture of DD transition with the uh, with the silver to ligand transitions uh, I'm sure you can use the level and this one is a charge because of uh, this uh, multiplicity the lowest energy multiplicity is now singlet it's also more stabilized and this low energy peak lowest energy peak is brighter compared to this one but in this case it did in this low and the, this peak is almost is not changing with this changing of the uh, ligands cytosine of guanines and another thing is if you remember in the experiment in the experimental one we show they would make their experimental group they are mainly looking for reason of increasing the intensity of this peak second peak and the lower in the intensity of third peak so in the silver in the in case of silver six this is on the one plus cluster and this also doublet confirmations if you look on the second peak this a red line red line is a mixture of guanine and cytosine it's increasing the intensity but in other two cases intensity is almost same i mean in the cytosine and guanine ligands but in the mix of both is increasing the intensity but this one is is also lowering the intensity compared to other one so this charge cluster is giving us a kind of similar i mean agreement with the experimental result so and also since they are not sure about their confirmation and also there have some other uh, support from the literature or the experimental work that cluster formation this silver cluster formation is it's initiate with the by the silver plus and the silver plus uh, uh, cation is acclumorators and making a cluster shape so almost all experimental results is supporting that silver uh, final silver cluster is could be uh, positive charge is not a neutral so almost so our silver six plus is showing the more agreement and is also cationic uh, cluster so we assume that it could be probable the stable cluster in this case and this is the showing and use so as i said it's showing the uh, transition nature this one is like uh, mostly D to T transition, silver silver transitions. But I had a one question one time I faced is the contribution of S to D transition and D to trans transition. I don't have a specific answer, but I'm going to include that in my new poster. I calculate this one. And the main peak, the highest intensity peak, this is the mainly main contribution is coming from the ligand uh, silver to ligand transition. So that's why this from the NTOs is one of the uh, fact uh, clear that the bright transitions is mainly coming from the ligand uh, charge transfer so ligand is uh, playing the important roles because it depends on the ligands it will change the tra transfer rate and as well as it will change the intensity of the just transition so that's why if you look on the side to see in this uh, there are more number of transitions from the silver to the ligands and in case of guanine they have uh, almost no transition so but in case when i add the cytosine of guanine it's increased in the transition uh, transfer but specifically to the cytosines so they have no transition to the guanine but guanine helps to charge transfer to the cytosines so uh, in the in the next studies i just form a dimer in the dimer formation uh, as i said they have a uh, they have no confirm confirmation and mechanism of formation so we thought that maybe they have a it's not a direct dimer formations have a separate and is forming a dimer through the pi pi stacking of the different ligands so i consider the different ligands and this indicating the ligand pi pi stacking i form the different um, uh, dimer and then optimize the dimer in the to look on the final structure so one thing is we form that in case of I mean they form the dimer in the CFL one and one and two plus we saw that there are some interactions between this cluster and ultimately we are getting a like uh, nano rod types uh, conformations and the effect of this nano rod formation you will see on the addition spectra if you, this one is showing the this one is not this one okay 
So this, this line is showing that dimer formations and this red line is a monomer one. If you look at uh, these, uh, because of this conformation, 1D conformations, it increases the in in intensity of this transition is very, very high. And the nature of this transition is, uh, interestingly, is a uh, silver to silver transitions. So we assume that they have a conformation, this conformation, CO2 1D conformations is making this silver silver transition bright and it's increasing the intensity significantly. So we assume that because of that, it's increased the intensity of the lowest energy peak and also this intense 30 peak is going down. So this is one of the reasons of forming this experimental result. And thank you, that's all. Okay, let's thank Javed. Questions? Suggestions? I have one. Uh, there are so many models, and if someone uh, is looking at it for the first time, maybe you may design a diagram. Uh, yeah. Remember, in previous uh, year ago, um, Sam Brown mm -hmm. was uh, making literature uh, search, and maybe you, you, you know this paper as well. It's a standard. On one axis, it's maybe charge, on another is number of uh, silver atoms. Mm -hmm. And then the thickness of, of a dot is whether it is bright or not. Oh, and then yeah. you, you can overview like 20 structures and tell. Yeah, I have that figure, yeah. I okay. only have one there. Okay, but thank uh, Javid once again. And in the remaining couple of minutes. Uh, There should be an update. It's two pages. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I just put the other version oh, of that okay. thing on just as like a comparison, I guess. So let me introduce London Johnson. Um, it is really recent work. <laughs> Therefore, there are no printouts. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but uh, I'm looking at the, the, the boundary between the perovskite and I guess I changed it to polyoxotitanate because that seems to be a more uh, appropriate name for the exact nanocluster that I'm looking at. Um, so, yeah, I've, I don't know, I've done the, uh, the motivation enough times, I guess. Um, so this was uh, shamelessly just copied and pasted from Fabulous Poster for now, so this is, <laughs> I'm gonna redo that a little bit, but those are the equations that I am using, um, minus the K and the K prime. I'm not going into quite that much depth with it. Um, still not really super visible. So, these three equations are just the self-consistency loop for DFT. Um, this is the correlation between two wave functions. So what you do is you look at one wave function at one time and another wave function at any, or sorry, at uh, any other wave function or the same one at the next time step. So uh, yeah, so this is your correlation. You're just looking at how much these wave functions overlap. Um, and then we use that to populate our red field tensor. Uh, we're using the approximation that your autocorrelation functions die extremely quickly, so we only really look at one time point, so this integral disappears and you only really have this term right here, no integral. Um, so that's essentially these two end up uh, going, uh, I don't know, I would have to look at this more in detail, I guess, but essentially this is what the Redfield tensor is populated with under the approximations that we're making. Um, Uh, and then these equations are how we model the actual, the time evolution of the electrons and holes. And then we use these ones to solve for the, um, the lifetime, I guess, the yeah, the relaxation lifetime. Uh, that doesn't seem like the right word, but uh, moving on.
So I might try to just draw up some schematics and put those here instead of this, but I am currently still trying to get that stuff to run on my computer. So for now, these are the models that I'm looking at, and these are their binding energies. I don't really know if, I, I can't think of a more appropriate spot to put them. If anyone has a better idea, let me know, because it seems a little out of place there. Um, these are the chemical structures of these. Um, yeah, these should be right. I did these off the top of my head, though, so I can't really guarantee that those are totally accurate. Um, so the only difference between the two polyoxotitanate clusters are the orientation and the ligands on um, sort of the flat side of the of the nanocluster. So in the acetate model, they're both passivated by these uh, um, isopropanol. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these isopropanol ligands, whereas one of them is passivated with hydroxyl ligands in this case, um, and these are the ones that are actually facing the perovskite here, whereas in this case you have the acetates kind of along the rim of your nanocluster adjacent to your, uh, your perovskite. So, uh, these are the density of states plots for these two configurations. Um, in the hydroxyl case, we have a band gap of 2.62 eV, and we have a slightly larger band gap in the acetate case of 2.99 eV. Um, and if you look at the actual, the HOMO and the LUMO bands, uh, red being HOMO, blue being LUMO, uh, you can see that you actually have a separated charge or a charge separated state, maybe would be a better way to say that. Uh, London, can yeah. I intervene? Yes. Uh, if it takes you um, about a month to swap uh, these little panels on the diagram, you can just swap all other figures and keep this intact. Oh, I, I just haven't been working on this yet. I, this wouldn't take me that long. I've just been okay. breaking my computer constantly trying to get the other figures done. Okay. Um, so. Okay, yeah, so then this is, I guess, a schematic of these two. Um, yeah, I suppose I might as well just flip them around. That'd be less work eventually, because I'm probably gonna have to redo everything anyway once I get all my new figures. Um, so this one is the isopropanol, or the acetate, and this one is the hydroxyl. Um, so these two are flipped around. So since you have a higher, uh, didn't we figure out a good way to say this last time? Um, Top edge of the valence band? Yeah. <laughs> since, yeah, this is the top edge of the valence band is higher in the perovskite case, and you have a lower uh, conduction band edge for the uh, polyoxotitanate, then you end up getting a charge transfer uh, after relaxation. Okay, so once you photo excite and then it relaxes, you end up with a charge transfer state. Whereas in the acetate model or isopropanol model, um, you have both of your band edges in the uh, polyoxotitanate. So upon relaxation, you won't end up with that charge state, which is not ideal for solar cell applications. Um, these are the absorption spectra of these two models, they look almost identical. The only difference really is just kind of the, the depths of these little uh, valleys in here, or I guess the height of the peaks. Um, so I marked right here, I don't know, there might be a better thing to mark here, but I just for now uh, put the, the excitation that I'm going to be showing in this next column. Uh, these were chosen because they had the highest oscillator strength of all the transitions. Did you double check the absorption spectrum? I haven't done that yet, I guess I, because I mean I've already, this one was already recalculated from what I had before, and I they still look the same, I guess, so I don't really know what exactly I would do to, to actually verify this. So my laptop has to use a different uh, figure render 
for MATLAB, so this image comes out looking a little crappy, and I'm still trying to get these ones done right now. So I mean, another computer would really be great if I could use that to try to make these figures, because this does not look as nice. But uh, um, so this figure is showing the, the charge density uh, with respect to Z. So I've got these models put next to here just so that you can have a visual reference of where physically this, the, the charge density is located. Um, so the brighter green color represents a higher electron density and the darker blue and purple color represents a larger hole density. Um, and so I guess, yeah, this one is I'm still working on that for the acetate right now. It uh, should actually have that running right now, but I don't. Um, so then I've got these green figures that kind of show the same thing, except instead of it being with respect to where you're at in your Z position or whatever, um, it's with respect to energy. So, uh, so this is the, these are both the highest oscillator strength excitations. Uh, I just chose those because they would probably be the most representative, or at least that would be my best guess if I can only do two of these. Um, so you initially excited up to Lumo plus 13, and you can see uh, a decent, I guess, relaxation rate. So once it gets to this point, the, uh, the electron has fully relaxed, and likewise down here, the hole has fully relaxed. So this would be the, um, the excitation lifetime, I guess. Um, and over here, you can see that the electron takes a little bit longer than the hole does. Um, so I, uh, oh yeah, it's just not showing up very well in this slide. So I basically cut out all of this stuff in the hydroxyl one. So I've got figures now that look more like this. Um, do these labels for my indices make sense, I guess? Is that is it kind of like clear what it is that I'm representing with those? Yeah. Okay. So this is showing the electron dynamics as it relaxes. It's just showing you which orbital, or the occupations of each orbital at um, some particular time. So as time goes on, you can see that it kind of transfers down into lower energy orbitals and uh, ends up in the LUMO eventually. And I'm gonna change these two to be more like LUMO plus whatever. And this is the, the same thing except for a hole. Um, so you've only got your four states involved here and it relaxes uh, at about the same rate. Um, and the same figure is just not as clean for the uh, the acetate model, um, same thing, I guess. So this is a graph of the, uh, so what I did is I took the, the 20 highest oscillator strength transitions and I ran those calculations for all of those and calculated what the, uh, the excitation lifetime would be in each case. And uh, these are the results that I got. So these are the electrons in the hydroxyl model. Um, oh, and by the, the dissipation energy, what that is is the, the absolute value of the energy difference between the initial excitation and the frontier orbital. So for the electrons, that would be whatever your excited state is, the energy of that excited state minus the LUMO. And for a hole, it would be the same thing except for the uh, HOMO instead of the LUMO. So this is essentially how much energy the electron or hole would have to give up to return to the frontier. Um, and I guess I don't really know how to um, plot trend lines for specific subsets of data. Um, Can you request help from Fatima? <laughs> I did, but I don't think that I made it very clear what exactly I was talking about. <laughs> I don't really know how to word it very well, but yeah, I, I, I don't know how to do 
a trend line for just this and then just this, maybe, maybe break, ignore that one. Break the data set, break the file on two pieces. Yeah. One file for this data set, another for another data set, and just. I guess the issue at that point would be that the legend would get very clunky and cumbersome and have a bunch of repeated entries. I don't know, maybe there's a way that you can tell it, don't include this or that, but I don't know how to do that off the top of my head. How did um, you import this graph figure? Uh, this one is just from Excel. I, okay. I put a bunch of stuff in a spreadsheet and tried to mm. make a plot, so that seemed like the natural choice. Um, how how many MATLAB you can do? Uh, what were you saying, Patrick? How many data sets you have here? I saw different colors. I, I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. How many data sets you have here? Uh, four of them. So I've got the, uh, the excitations for the electrons in the hydroxyl model, uh, the holes for the hydroxyl model, the electrons for the isopropanol model here, and then the holes for the isopropanol model right here. So what you can do, you can click on that. Um, I saw, I see that uh, there is a data set, blue points. Yep. So if you click over the blue one of the blue points, mm -hmm. right click. Yep. Then you will see a couple of options. Okay, one option is add trend line. Yep. So you will select that one. And it yeah. And different options. Because I, I mean, this is a trend line for all of the blue data, but I... Uh, yeah. The, the, what I would like to do is make a trend line for just this subset of the blue data, and then just this subset of the blue data, and then likewise, just this subset of the gray data, just this one of the yellow one, just this one of the yellow one, you know, maybe just this one of the orange one, or I could probably do the whole thing, but. Well, yeah, the orange one wouldn't be so bad just to do the whole thing all in one shot, because that's fairly linear, but the other ones are segmented chunks of being linear instead of. Or I think this first. Like uh, first, I think three sets of data, like uh, between zero to zero point eight. Uh, where at? Dissipation energy, zero, yeah. zero point eight. They are different from the from above zero point eight. Right. Yeah. So I think you can make two different uh, plots then. Okay. Yeah. Then you can click this, and if you. If you increase the y-axis, uh, suppose instead of three, you say set five, then this data points will be closer. And yeah, I guess I tried to zoom in as much to show as much detail as possible. But yeah, the, up in this region at least, the, uh, the electron uh, excitation lifetimes are uh, not exactly organized. <laughs> it's scattered. Yeah. There doesn't really seem to be much of a trend here at all. But there was one particular excitation that was unstable in the code, so some of this could be an artifact of that. It might just be due to instabilities. I don't really You are the know. only participant in the conference. Okay. <laughs> um, but I guess... I suppose I can mention that it, it seems like there's a... Uh, a longer excitation lifetime for the acetate electrons up until a certain energy point. Your call um, will be disconnected. Although I guess I don't really know what happens up here in the acetate model, because um, none of those were... Uh, I'll, I'll bring it up. Uh, it's possible. But yeah, like I said, the, the data came from the 20 highest oscillator strength excitations in each case, so... There just isn't really the data there for that right now. Um, but you can see that the the whole lifetime in the hydroxyl case is uh, a little bit longer. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I kind of same conclusions as before, except I took a couple of them out because uh, those were not based on the right data. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they seem 
fairly comparable. Really, the major difference between these two models is the the band structure at the edge. Um, so that kind of seems to imply that the hydroxyl model would be more favorable for solar cell applications. And then I guess I man, those do not show up very well. In addition, basically, I have the same plot. Um, this is exactly the same plot as I put on the uh, like right before the conclusions. This is just the relaxation rates instead of the <laughs> um, so this is the relaxation rates instead of the charge carrier lifetime so it's just they're uh, reciprocals of each other um, I'm kind of leaning towards using this one because that seems to use the space better but if anybody has any good ideas for what I could put in this big blank white space over here I'm open to ideas <laughs> Use log plot and then uh, weights basically disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's it? Yep. Well, thank London. <laughs> Any quick questions or suggestions? Why is your binding energy negative? Don't worry about it, I'll, I'll change it. <laughs> Yeah, whenever I see a negative binding energy, that kind of implies it doesn't want to be binded. Yeah, no, it's I just subtracted the one way and like typed up an email real quick with that, and then uh, so it's just, just copy your, pasted your like twenty minutes ago. <laughs> so it is your definition. Like the more negative, the stronger it binds. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, that, I will change that for sure. More questions. Okay, we, we had some uh, suggestions and questions in the, during the talk, and they will be recorded so you can listen for, for the feedback. Mm -hmm. Then uh, let's thank London and all uh, speakers. So it would be really great if you complete uh, posters tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last day when specific grant can be charged for printing. Uh, it, it, it's still there are ch chances to, to print later, but tomorrow it will be much easier. Follow the suggestions from Jabot. He seemed to send an uh, email to everyone. And uh, if you're not 100% sure, you can quickly send the uh, latest version to whoever is your primary advisor. But uh, just plan on, on completing it. Okay, and uh, we will have the last meeting before going to the conference on Friday, but there will be no posters, only oral things, because posters should be ready by then.